thank you so much for being here with us today. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we are in, uh, I believe, week five now of our series called Eight Words That Will Change Your Life. And today, we are going to look at the word help. Can everybody just say help right now? Help. Isn't that a beautiful word? No, nah, man. I don't like that word at all. It's gross. Like most of us struggle with that word. It's hard to say, especially when we have to look at somebody and say, um, do, like when somebody looks at us and says, do you need help? Like that is hard. Like we, we understand that we're born needing help. Like when babies are born, babies need help. And we understand that when you get old, you reach a certain age where you're going to need help. But we do this thing in the middle of our life where we convince ourselves that we can get along without anybody's help at all. And it only takes a little bit of age or a little bit of frustration or a trip to Ikea to remind us that we need help. That's the thing that happens. Listen, we, I, went, I remember buying Ikea furniture uh, in our marriage early on. Um, and I don't know if you've ever put together Ikea furniture. It will increase your prayer life and your faith activity a lot. And putting together Ikea furniture is hard because there's almost, you're always missing instructions. And you always got parts you don't need and you're missing parts that you do need. And even the parts you do have, they don't have regular la- names. And they're all in Swedish. So you don't understand anything. So they're like, hey, put the flink and flogger in slot C. And you're like, I don't know what any of that means. It's confusing and it freaks you out. And then what would happen in our life is I'd be putting something together and I'm trying my best. I mean, I'm putting into it. I'm sweating. I'm working hours. And then Crystal walks in and she says, baby, do you need some help? Let me tell you how you know if you have a problem with help. If when somebody says, baby, do you need help? You hear Hey, idiot. I don't understand why you can't figure this out. I'm going to take over. Why don't you top off Mama's Dr. Pepper? We'll figure out something else that you can do, okay? We don't like to ask for help because it makes us feel weak. Or maybe it's not even that. Maybe I don't want to feel like I owe somebody something. I know a lot of people, I don't want to ask for help because then I'll owe somebody something. Or maybe you're in a situation where you need help, but you don't even realize that you do need help, and so you don't ask for help because you don't recognize that you need it. Or maybe you do know you need it, but you are stubborn. If you you know a stubborn person, raise your hand, okay? And all the stubborn people just refuse to vote right then. That's what happened, okay? He don't get to tell me what to do, okay? We all know somebody that's stubborn. Like we do, I watched it with my foster girls. They're little, and they do the same thing my kids did when they were small. They're like, hey, uh, we're going to tie your shoes. They don't know how to tie their shoes correctly. Let, let, let me help you tie your shoe. No, I'll tie it. But, but you don't know how, baby. Let me help you out. No, I'll tie it. They tie and just tie a knot on top of a knot on top of a knot. Next thing you know, I got to get, get tweezers and a magnifying glass and my teeth to it, trying to get these things on. I, I don't know if you're supposed to use your teeth. How many of you have ever used teeth to get a knot out? Thank you. Okay, so it makes me feel a little bit better. And you work on it, and you're like, I, we got in all this problem simply because you're stubborn. Or you're afraid you're going to lose control. If I ask for help, i got to give up control. As a matter of fact, there is very clearly, we lean heavily, that there is one gender that has a harder time asking for help. But does anybody want to guess which one? Mm-hmm. All the men just fell silent and all the women just said, amen, men, men, men. As a matter of fact, let me tell you how crazy this is. We live in an age where you can tell your phone to give you instructions and directions on how to get anywhere. And in 2019, they did a survey. In the age of GPS, the average man in America will drive 276 miles lost. Because he will, if you're married to that man, raise your hand right there. Okay, thank you. Because they will not, as a matter of fact, the same study, the same study decided to prove something and they put a bunch of men in with barbers, trained barbers that were doing haircuts and shaves and they asked these men to tell them what kind of help they needed in life and these men gushed. They just began to open up incredibly about all the areas of their life they needed help to total strangers who were cutting their hair and shaving them. And the only, this is not a joke, this is literally what happened. You can look up the study. The, what the only conclusion they could come to is that men will only only ask for help when sharp objects are pointed at their head. <laughs> they don't want to ask. It's crazy. We, we have to understand that, that there is a problem with that. 
Because we in our culture think it's wrong to ask for or need help. As a matter of fact, in in our culture today, success is self-sufficiency. Pull myself up by my own bootstraps. My boots are all strapless. I don't know what kind of boots y'all are wearing, okay? Like, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps is a thing that we say, and literally what we're saying is success is that I need help from no one, which then in reverse means that failure is needing help from anyone. It's a problem because we all need help. Come on, can I get a good amen this morning? We need help. It's all throughout Scripture. Mary, the mother of Jesus, needed help turning water into wine. Moses needed help <clears throat> with the bread. See, Noah needed help with the boat. Uh, Hannah needed help getting pregnant. We all need, listen, if you've ever had a need for help in your marriage, money, kids, job struggles, or grief, can I just hear you say amen this morning? Amen. We all need help. And so, but we're too proud to ask for it. So we've created a less vulnerable word that we can say that makes us feel better about us. We just added something to the beginning, self-help. Here's what that means. I have come to the end of my resources. I've come to the end of my abilities. I need help. Do you know who will be the best person to ask? Me. That's stupid on steroids. Like, I don't understand that at all. And yet self-help last year was a $12 billion industry. We Listen, we so don't want to ask for help from actual living creatures. We have developed technology that we ask for help instead. Alexa, help me. Siri, help me. Okay, Google, help me. Like we will do, matter of fact, if you, listen, it was one of the funniest things. If you ask your Siri, don't do it now, you can do it later. Uh, Siri, are you married? Your Siri will say, I am married to the idea of helping people. Like, we won't ask for help. That's the way we're wired. We think there's something wrong with it. So the reality is we are going for self-help. We're going for technology help. So we're not really arguing over whether or not we need help. We're arguing over whether, where we should go for it. And so this morning, that's the question we want to answer. If self-help is faith and hope in me, then mature help is faith and hope in Jesus Christ. And that is life-changing. We've got to learn to ask for help. And I was going to have everybody turn to each other and say, I need help. But I know that's too vulnerable. So will you turn to somebody and say, you need help right now, just right now. (laughs) Let me tell you what the definition of the word help actually is. Here's what it means. Help means making something easier for someone else by offering your service. Who wouldn't want that? The only other kind of help is what we call urgent assistance, which is help, I'm drowning. And we would all do that. There's nothing wrong with the word help. As a matter of fact, without help, things that are red flags today turn into red alerts tomorrow. Like there's warning signs where we go, I need help, I need help. And then if we don't do it, warning signs turn into actual problems. Like we go into our life and we say, you know what, I'm a little over budget. I should probably get some financial counseling. But I don't want to ask for help. Turn around, I wind up deep in debt and full of shame. I've got unresolved conflict in my marriage, but we don't want to ask for help because, you know, we should be able to handle this on our own, and somehow we end up in a brutal and tragic divorce. I've got some behavioral issues, some some behaviors that that I struggle with that I can't seem to to overcome, but I don't want to ask for help because I'm supposed to be strong, and we wind up in addiction. Or, or, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm in flirtation and I really need to probably talk to somebody about that. I don't want it to go too far, but I don't want to be honest or vulnerable with anybody and ask for help and I wind up in an affair. I've got, I'm procrastinating. I put everything off I need to do and, and I don't do the things that I need to do now and I should ask for help. I should get somebody to speak into my life and now I end up in unemployment and I'm struggling. Or, or listen, I get people that say, Jason, I have the spiritual gift of sarcasm and negativity. It is a spiritual gift from the devil. Listen, when we live in that, then we later wonder why we wind up alone and without friends. It takes more courage to say help than it does to pretend we don't need it. And this morning, I'm going to ask you to be courageous, to acknowledge where we need help. And I want to see, show this to you in a story in Luke chapter 7. An unlikely person is going to ask for an unbelievable help. 
from the Lord. It starts in seven, <clears throat> chapter 7, verse 1 in the book of Luke. It says, when he had concluded, he is Jesus here. So Jesus has been doing some teaching. <clears throat> when he concluded saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. A centurion's servant, so let me make sure you understand. The centurion, who's a Roman officer, he didn't go to Jesus. He sent one of his servants to go talk to Jesus on his behalf. So a centurion's servant, who was highly valued by him, was sick and about to die. So this Roman officer is about to die. He sends a friend. When the centurion heard about Jesus, and that's a key phrase. See, if you read backwards just a little bit before chapter 7, Jesus has been rolling around doing miracles and healings and doing incredible things. And the centurion has heard some stuff. He says when he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, which is weird. He's a Roman officer who was actually paid to oppress the Jewish people. But for some reason, the Jewish people like him. Something's happened. We'll get more to that in a minute. So the Jewish elders to him, requesting him to come and save the life of his servant. <clears throat> when they reached Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, he's worthy for you to grant this because he loves our nation and he's built us a synagogue. I want you to look, like, look at what's going on here. Other people are actually help, asking for help on his behalf. Why? Because he's helped them also. They've been a recipient of his help, and they want help for him, and I think that's powerful. Let me give you a little insight into this guy. So he's, he's a Roman soldier, a Roman officer. He's a big deal. He's a success. His name is known, but he has run out of something. He realizes there's something he can't do, and he goes to tell Jesus what he doesn't have enough of. In other words, he goes to ask for help. He says, I need something from you that my training cannot provide. I need help, and he knows who to look for, and I love that. In verse six, it says, and Jesus went with him. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to tell him, <clears throat> Lord, don't trouble yourself, since I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. That is why I don't even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I, too, am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes. This other one, come, and he comes. To my servant, do this, and he does it. And so he's saying, like, Jesus, like, so Jesus is coming to help. He's going to go head off. This guy needs help. He sends somebody to ask for help. Jesus is heading to him. And when he gets close to the house, he goes, no, 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 no. Don't even come to the house. I'm not worthy of it. Just say the words. Tell us what to do. And whatever you tell us to do, we'll do that. Whatever you say do, Jesus, we'll do that. We'll believe that. That's what we'll do. And I want to tell you, if you want help, that is the key. If you want help in your ordinary life, if you want a little bit of heaven to descend onto earth in your life, then whatever Jesus tells you to do, do that. That's what you need to do. When he says, love your neighbor, some of y'all going, you ain't met my neighbor. Hmm? Jesus has. And you may go, well, he's a butthead. I get it. Go love him. And you go, well, okay, well, that one's not too bad. What about love your enemy? Ooh, wait a second. Jason, I've spent a lot of years building up this particular enemy. We, we've got a history. Jesus says, go love your enemy. Love your neighbor. Pray for those who persecute you. Care for the poor. Seek first the kingdom of God. Man, I get people sometimes that'll ask me, like, Jason, like, this is the question I get. I had it last week in my office. People will come in and they'll go, hey, what kind of church is this? Now, what they're asking is for denomination, which is fine. I'll give them some of that information. But when you really want to know what kind of church this is, let me tell you what kind of church I hope we always are. I hope we're a church that whatever Jesus says do, we do that. That's the kind of church I hope we are. That's the kind of church I always want us to be. People ask me all the time, like, why? Why, Jason, do so many people in Crossroads have passions to do certain things? Because Jesus told us to. Oh, why do we love widows and orphans? Because Jesus told us to. Why do we bless our community this way? Because Jesus told us to. Why are we generous in the way we are? Because Jesus told us to. Why do we do things like the big give? We have a, we have a group yesterday that went to a crisis luncheon here in Rowlett for people who are coming out of tragic situations in our community, people who have had family members commit suicide, gathered for a lunch, and your church helped pay for that lunch, and we sent people there to go minister to them. Tonight, there's a group of people, as a part of our big give, going to a place called Jonathan's Place. It is a home for children who are in foster care, but this particular area we're going to is older kids in foster care, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And let me tell you a truth about kids that are older in foster care. And I don't mean this to be ugly, but I'm going to be honest. Nobody wants them. And a lot of times they don't want anybody else. It goes both ways. And so because of that, because they're not cute little bitty kids, nobody ministers to them. For the last three years, multiple times a year, we've made it the calling of our church to go minister to people that nobody else necessarily wants to minister to. 
I'm not saying we're the only ones, don't misunderstand me, but we go. And so tonight we have a group of people going and bringing their Christmas to them. Going and loving on those kids. It happens to be all girls at this particular time. Staying in residence there. And there, in a few years, some of them will age out of the foster care system. And when they do, listen, the, the statistics for what happens next is horrible. And our hope is that if they feel loved here, maybe when they need something the most, it's Jesus they'll look for help from. And so we go. As a matter of fact, let me tell you something really cool about the Big Give. If you've not been around here for a while, this year, we're not just doing the Big Give. Your generosity over the last four years has inspired four other churches, three other churches, excuse me. So there's actually three other churches in two different states, and all of them are doing the big give this year because you started being generous. Your generosity encouraged generosity. And so it is going farther, faster than you even realize. And can we just thank God for that, man? <clears throat> Let's look at what happens next. Sorry, I get off on a tangent a little bit. Whatever he do, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And in verse nine, it says, Jesus heard this and was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not heard such a great faith in, even in Israel. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant completely healed. Come on now. I want you to listen to how powerful God is in this moment. Jesus doesn't even have to show up for this to happen. His presence is there. He is moving. And so I want you to see the equation of how this happens. This guy admits that he needs help. He says, I'll do whatever Jesus tells me to do. And then the glory of God gets revealed in a miraculous way. That's the way God works over and over and over. What starts with the word help, telling him what we're out of, leads to his glory that gets revealed, and it's a launching point for a miracle. Every single time you have reached a point where you would say, I need help, what you need to recognize is in that moment you have created a launching point for something miraculous to happen. You've created a moment where you said, God, I've reached the end of me. I'm gonna need you. And God goes, whoo, you have no idea what you just asked for. I got this. But here's how often it happens in our life. Michael, would you come up here? I'm going to borrow you for a minute. And Senior Clements. We are a very proud culture in our world. And so we need help, but we don't want to ask for help. So we're going to put on some weight of help. I don't know if you can get your arm in there. There you go. Oh, no, just carry it. There we go. So we need help, but we don't just need a little help. Because life is hard. We need a lot of help. We need more help. Here you go, Michael. Just can you hold on to that? Got another one for you. There we go. And let's get one more. So here's what happens with Michael. Come on over here, big guy. We've got all this stuff burdening us, all this stuff weighing us down. And Michael's going to walk through life. I'm going to just you kind of follow me, okay? We're going to go slow. You can just be there and look great. Okay, here we go. So we go through life not asking for help, all the time carrying this load. And as we're carrying this load, you know what we're getting? worn out. We're getting tired. And so here's what happens. God not only wants to free us from this, God not only wants to be our helper, but God wants our life to help other people. And so what ends up happening looks like this. Dwayne, can you stand up for a minute? Can you just look at, look at Michael and say, Michael, I need help. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Tell Michael you need help. Okay, Michael's going to go, oh, great, I'd love to help. Unfortunately, I'm exhausted. I can't make it back there, and so we're gonna we use some Christianese so that we don't feel bad. We'll say, Dwayne, we praying for you. No, 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 you stay right there. <laughs> Michael can't make it back there because Michael don't have the energy to go. So Michael continues on his life. He's missed out on that opportunity. Kevin, can you stand up real quick and just say, hey, Michael, I need help. Hey, Michael, I need help. Not right there. Michael going, man, I'd love to. I'll be praying for you, brother, but I can't make it back there. I'm already weighed down by this stuff. I don't have the capacity to go and be a benefit. I don't have the capacity to go and be a blessing to you because I'm unwilling to be obedient to God and to trust in him and to put my hope in him. I'm trying to carry the burden of life alone and what it's done is it has minimized what God can do in my life. It has taken me off mission. It has taken me away from what God wants. It has actually kept me from experiencing not only the freedom in my life, but I've missed the miracle of being able to participate in other people's lives. And God says, I want to help. How are you feeling? What's in here? <laughs> What's, reams of paper. Oh, well. Okay. <laughs> so, Michael, does that feel any better? How about that? That's better. Okay. Is this helping? Oh, yeah. All right. So, Michael goes and asks for help. And listen, what he feels in this moment is relief. 
And that's what we long for when we ask for help is we're looking for, you can go ahead, we're looking for this sense of relief that comes when we ask for help. But our pride keeps us from doing it. It delays the miracle. We miss opportunities. We're worn down and shut down when everything could have been different if we would simply ask for help. Look at what Jesus responds with when the, the, when the Roman officer asks for help. There's this phrase that happens. Can you back up to that? I love this. Bottom line, Jesus heard this and was amazed. Does that blow your mind? That should blow your mind. He's God. God you don't, you, he's God. He knows what's going to happen. And he's still amazed. Like some people are going, well, how is that possible? Raise your hand if you're a parent. Okay, there's stuff that you've experienced. You knew your kid was eventually going to do it, but then when they did it, you were like, oh, that was better than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> that was amazing. Like you just got floored by it. That's what's happening right here. Jesus knew it was coming, and it still got him a little bit because this guy had two things. One, he believed Jesus could help him, and two, he was humble enough to ask. This guy didn't grow up religious. He didn't. If you read the whole thing, he grew up as a Roman officer. He's not trained in this belief system, but something had to have happened because somewhere along the way, this guy built a synagogue. He actually built a church for the people of God to worship in. And when he needs help the most, the person he seeks out is Jesus because he believed. And he's about to ask for something huge, and that requires humility. We all need to believe that Jesus can help us and be humble enough to ask for it. But let me tell you what happens. Satan loves to lie. And so what he says when you need help is he steps into your life and he goes, hey, nobody wants to help you. God for sure doesn't want to help you. And here's the good news for you. God's not done helping you. He's not on the verge of walking away this morning. He's not at this moment in your life where he goes, look, that was your last chance, I'm out. That's not how our father operates. He wants to help. God's not asking for your perfection. You may fall over and over and over, and a lot of times there's guilt in that, where we go, well, I can't ask for help on that again. I just asked for help on that. And God's going, no, come to me. Come to me again and again and again and again. Come to me. He's not asking for your perfection. He's asking for you to be humble. See, here's what God wants you to know when we ask for help. The solution to your marriage is not for you to get better at marriage. The solution to your kids and your parenting is not for you to simply get better at parenting. The solution to your finances isn't for you to get better at finances. The solution to your work problems isn't just for you to be a better employee. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. But the solution to those things is for you to say, God, I need help. And the solution is that you get more connected to Jesus. That's the problem solver. Now, I know there's going to be the, the skeptic, the cynic in the room, and I get it. Who goes, Jason, I did both those things. I believe and I was humble and he did not help me in my need. And if that's you sitting there right now, I just want you to know, man, I understand. I've been there. And I would just challenge that maybe we need to ask a different question in that moment. And that's this. Not just God, will you help? But what is God trying to help you do? We know what you want him to do but what is he actually trying to help you do and here's what i want you don't miss this if you're one of those people that go i've asked and nothing's happened god's primary concern is not giving you what you and i need in a given moment god's primary concern is helping you look more like jesus now, that's not, like, that's not the hope everybody wants. Like, what everybody would love to come to church is to have an Oprah moment, right? Like, well, Jason, we're all in debt. We came to a financial seminar. We're going to learn about what God's going to do for freedom. And we go, and you get out of debt, and you get out of debt, and you get out of debt, and you get out of debt. But that doesn't reshape your character. That doesn't change your heart. And if you don't change your heart, don't alter your character, then if, even if God gives you immediate relief, you'll simply use it to get deeper in trouble. 
I want you to see what this looks like because we do struggle with this. We struggle with this spiritually, relationally, financially. I will never forget as long as I live, early in mine and Crystal's marriage, we were broke. Anybody ever been, not broke, but like baroque? Anybody ever been there? Okay, like you were like baroque. Like it, I mean, it was bad. Like I've said this before, but like we were the people that go to KFC and lick other people's fingers. Like it was just, it was, it was rough, okay? And you're sitting there going, God, it can't get any worse. And you're not saying like it's not possible to get any worse. You're saying, God, I don't think we have the capacity for it to get anywhere. It can't get any worse. And in that moment, I will never forget driving my old car down an interstate and, and you're going, God, something needs to happen. Something's got to give. I need some help. And then my car stopped running. And God, it was as if God was like, oh, you think it can't get any worse? I will show you. And somehow, I don't know how, but I got through traffic over to the side of the road and then stopped. And I was like, God, where are you? And God goes, uh, why don't you trust me? And I was like, what, what do you mean, what don't I trust you? I trust you. He goes, Jason, listen, you're worried about all these financial issues in your life. I just stopped your car in the middle of the interstate and navigated you to safety on the side of the road. What, why don't you trust me? You have any idea what I'm capable of? And I went, oh God, I get it. I get what you're saying. I trust you. And then I had one of these moments, these moments that you hear in people's story and kind of annoys you because you wish it would happen in your story. Where you're on the side of the road and you go, well, I don't know what to do. I'm gonna try to turn my car over and I'm gonna pray. I literally lay hands on my steering wheel, okay? I'm like, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, can you just make this car run? And then I turn the key over and guess what? It started. And so I was like, oh, snap. It was an earlier time. And I got in my car, I started up, I drove home. I walked into Crystal. I said, Crystal, baby, did you check the mail today? Money's coming. God told me on the interstate, it was coming. God's gonna fix the problem. Everything's gonna be fixed. Are you ready to check the mail? It's probably gonna come in a phone call. Somebody we know is gonna call us and they're just bringing cash. It's gonna be incredible. Well, God did help me. But he did not help me the way I had hoped in that moment. He did not help me in the way that I expected I wanted immediate resources. He wanted to build a Christ-like character in me. And so instead of that happening, you know what actually happened? Is God began to change my heart over the next three to five years of my life by going into my heart and painfully scraping out every bit of pride and greed and selfishness that was dominating my heart. And over a period of time, my heart changed with the word help. See, Jesus wants that for all of us. He actually gives us a person called the helper. The Bible says as Jesus was getting ready to go head on back to heaven, he says, guys, I'm about to get, but I'm sending somebody. And he's the helper. That's what the Holy Spirit is called in scripture, the helper. As a matter of fact, I want you to look at what, what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, we all with unveiled faces as looking in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed. Our heart is being changed into the same image from glory to glory. For, the, for uh, Excuse me, this is from the Lord who is the what? Spirit. Spirit. He's man, I'm taking the helper and the helper is going to reshape your heart and your character. And that, more than any immediate resource I could give you, that is your help. Now, some people will hear this and go, well, that's great, Jason. I don't see how that helps me today. I don't see how that helps me in this life, in this world. And I just want to give you a couple of thoughts as we conclude, and that's this. I want you to imagine what it would look like, what it would feel like if a group of people in this world were filled with humility. If you had a group of people that were asking God for help, believing in the impossible, that they would help each other. Imagine what that would look like. Like we have a culture that wants to separate everybody. It wants to separate us based on anything. It will you politics, finance, race, anything, any ethnicity, anything where the world wants to go, no, you are different groups. You are not the same. You are not connected. And the Bible says, no, when we ask for help and we look at it, somebody, we say, you are not just a person. You are my brother. You are my sister. Your problem is not just your problem. Your problem is my problem. And my problem is your problem. And that brings together every ethnicity, every race. That brings together every nation. That brings together every Every person in this world through all these financial barriers of across political spectrums to say we are here together to be help to each other to solve just imagine what that world looks like we'll call it the church 
That's what this is supposed to look like. Not everybody in this room agrees on everything, but we agree on the most important things. Can I get a good amen this morning? And what is big in our life is always going to dominate these little things that try to tear us apart. We're not going to let it happen. Are you with me in this, church? We're not going to let it happen. We need help because, excuse me, we help because Jesus helped us first. He saw us struggling. We had, he had a resource that we didn't have. So he stepped out of heaven, put on skin, and stepped into the earth to help. Every great miraculous thing that is a part of your life today started with the word help. And actually help is a clue to your identity. Did you know that? See, we think that we're created for independence, but independence actually is you looking at God and saying, no thanks, God, I got this. I'm gonna live in my self-sufficiency. And that ends in disaster. Help is what we are made for. Not independence, but listen, continual dependence on God. To ask him for help and to live in the reality of that help in surrender and friendship. As a matter of fact, that's what salvation is. If you have ever received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's because you reached a point in your life where you realized you couldn't save you and you finally said, help. And the helper responded. Man, you've got to love that. You've got to love that. And we ask for help. We don't just avoid disaster, though. We see heaven come to earth. I put a post out on Facebook this week. I'm going to be honest with you. I thought I'd get a couple of little quick examples that I could share with you this morning. What I got was a lot more. I posted something that basically just said, where have you needed help? When have you had to ask God for help? I got a ton of responses on the public post, and then my messenger inbox got flooded with long, beautiful, painful, private stories. I want to read to you, I want to sum up just some of the things that people said, here's where I had to ask for help, and maybe this is you. You'll hear some things repeated, that's because they were repeated. Miscarriages, addiction, infertility, recovering from the accident, ignoring the red flags, miscarriages, infertility, Tourette's and the fear of passing that disease on to my child, life after divorce, anxiety, Depression, substance abuse, a suicidal child, abuse, losing a child, the loss of my brother, my marriage, abuse, abandonment, forgiving myself, depression, addiction, a son's suicide, a brother's suicide, the loss of a job, a dad that walked out on us, miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage, a dead marriage, drug addiction, gambling addiction, infertility, adoption, being embarrassed from my rape, depression, abusive relationships, PTSD, suicidal thoughts, 28 years of drug addiction, the loss of my father and declining health. I said... We asked for help. And as I got that, I thought, well, I need to ask a follow-up question. And I said, what, did you, what happened when you got help? Now, you don't, if you don't believe in miracles, you're going to have to ignore everything I'm about to say. Because after everything I just read to you, for God to redeem that, if you don't think that's a miracle, you and I don't agree. Because every one of these is miraculous to me. And here's the responses. I found a love I could not imagine. I found a friend. I got through my husband's cancer struggle and my faith and relationship with the Lord is stronger and I'm thankful. When you're thankful for cancer, something's happened. He brought me back from death. There's a longer story behind this but I was supposed to be a vegetable for the rest of my life. It's 17 years later and I have a wife and kids. I found freedom from meth addiction. I found forgiveness for the man who destroyed my life. I got beyond the nightmares. I was made complete in Christ. God has been at my side. I am sober. I am clean. I have peace. I feel restored. 
after the suicide attempt, I realized he wasn't through with me. I found freedom from drug addiction and domestic violence. I rely on God's word every day. I am a suicide survivor. My faith is stronger than my fears. I found his goodness and graciousness. Without Christ, I would have spent a long time sitting in perpetual hate, but now I have a joyful path. Come on. That is awesome. And there are people that didn't write in, and there are lots of people that I just read, and you're in this room. And so here's what I want to say to you to wrap this up. He will not only help you, he will use your help me story to help somebody else. See, that's the depth of God's redemption. He doesn't just restore your life. He's going to use your miraculous, redemptive story to be a blessing to somebody that I couldn't ever speak to like that, that I could never touch, but you can because his miracle is still alive in you. It is still moving in you. And it started with one word, help. Help.